Seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Welcome to Wonderlust. In this, the second episode of the Ghost of the Prairie series, I'm going to tell you the story of the ecological collapse of the Plains Bison in the United States. It's a story of violent greed, when the concept of manifest destiny and the construction of the transcontinental railroad opened the floodgates to unfettered Western expansion and market hunting. It's also a story of broken promises and the systematic subjugation of native populations and the willful destruction of American wildlife to achieve that goal. But long before the golden spike signaling the final construction of the transcontinental railroad was laid, our story takes us to another time when horses walked American soil for the first time in over 11,000 years. Horses in North America have a deep and intertwined history. Eohippus, the size of a golden retriever and the earliest known horse species, first appeared in the fossil record 52 million years ago. And it was not until 2.5 million years ago that horses dispersed into Asia and Europe. Though the causes are still debated, including changes in habitat, their North American reign ended at the end of the Pleistocene, and it was not until European explorers reintroduced them in the 15th and 16th centuries that the beat of horse hooves was heard on the continent once more. Over time, through both peaceful and violent interactions with Spanish colonists, native tribes began to adopt the horse into their existence. While many tribes acquired horses, it was the Comanche who first fully wove the horse into the fabric of their society. Breaking off from the Shoshone people in present-day Wyoming, they took their horses and moved southward. Over the following years, through the combat potential offered by the horse, they would come to hold a vast territory comprising parts of Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Kansas. And in part, it was the exposure to the horse's sacred role in Comanche society that led other tribal peoples to more fully adopt the horse into the plains culture. And this adoption would echo through their being. The winds of change rippled through the prairies, and life would be forever changed. Horses allowed newfound mobility, and tribes that were once largely sedentary agriculturalists found themselves able to cross vast distances and become mobile hunters. And with this mobility, they found themselves more easily able to access the great bison herds. Consequently, the role of the bison became yet more central into the existence of numerous tribes and also became a factor in heightened intertribal conflicts. Raids on the camps of other tribes became more unpredictable and more damaging. Over the next century, the introduction of firearms, a potential the trade in bison offered, would for the first time pressure the bison herds at human hands. By the 1830s, responding to demand for bison robes and meat by white colonists, the Comanche and other tribes would kill approximately 280,000 bison a year. But these impacts would pale in comparison to the tide of destruction that was brought on the heels of the introduction of another horse to the plains, the Iron Horse. Manifest Destiny, the impulse to move westward and expand the country's domain, often thought to be divinely mandated, was a core part of the ethos of the United States. Repeatedly and willfully, the country signed treaties with native peoples, only to break those treaties and force tribes further and further west in their wake, whether by law or by action. This displacement also added pressure to the bison herds, as tribes on the move hunted to feed themselves. But for all of their ambitions, widespread Western expansion proved immensely difficult in the Great Plains. Without means of mass transport, the terrain was too rugged and the places too remote. As it has been since the formation of the country, conflict with native peoples was widespread, and smaller groups of settlers were at high risk of attack. It was this slowness and dangerousness of travel that led those in the East to begin construction of the first transcontinental railroad of the United States. Construction of the railroad invoked conflict for humans and animals alike. Construction crews were guarded by the military and both needed to be fed. This hunting of bison was what led the famed Buffalo Bill to gain his name after he killed over 4,000 of the animals in a year and a half period in Kansas. Wherever the railroad came, so did the destructive forces of market hunting. For fashion and for function, the demand of bison parts was vast, and railways offered an efficient means of both systematic hunting and movement of parts. 
Railroad companies rallied for the extermination of the animal, seeing it as a threat to its travel pace and safety. Trains would often slow to the pace of the bison herd so that its travelers can shoot from the sides and rooftop. Bison would be shot, their pelts and tongues removed, and the carcasses left to rot, often lining endless miles of track. Upon rotting, their bones were collected and shipped to be processed for fertilizer, glue, and other uses. It was one of these shipments of skulls that was the focus of the most famous photograph of this troubled time in history. While these forces all acted in consort, the war against the native populations was also waged through the bison. The bison herds were the lifeblood of the plains peoples and their way of life, and those in charge of waging war against them recognized this. General Sheridan, placed in charge of the wars of the 1860s, made this deliberately clear in his testimony to Congress when protection of the bison from market hunters was debated. These men have done more in the last two years, and will do more in the next year to settle the vexed Indian question than the entire regular army has done in the last 40 years. They are destroying the Indian's commissary, and it is a well-known fact that an army losing its base of supplies is placed at a great disadvantage. Send them powder and lead, if you will, but for a lasting peace, let them kill, skin, and sell until the buffaloes are exterminated. Then your prairies can be covered with speckled cattle. And as predicted by General Sheridan, the free-roaming nature of the Plains natives declined with the bison, and by the 1890s, all tribes in the United States were confined to reservations and made to be reliant on U.S. government support. That support often never came. But the bison's story, as sad and dramatic as it was, would not be destined to end the same way as the passenger pigeon. Protection came before complete extermination could be achieved. A small number of individuals captured bison during their slaughter and began to form their own herds. These herds, along with the 25 animals that remained to the protected Yellowstone National Park, would form the basis of a dramatic recovery whose effects can be felt in the modern age. In many places, the thunder of the prairies reverberates once more, and it is that story that we will explore in the next episode. Until then, wander in wonder. If you enjoyed this content and want to bring it out into the wider world, please like, comment, subscribe, or share.